My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin, and my subject is Trade Beyond the Roman Frontiers. I have published several books on this subject. I am a member of the Council of the Classical Association of Northern Ireland, and I'm on the Council of the Classical Association of Ireland. The question is, did the Roman Empire attack Irish territory? The text of this reading is available from the journal Classics Ireland. Roman governors usually held office for three years. But when the Emperor Vespasian died in June AD 79, his eldest son Titus permitted Agricola to remain in command. Titus took his 15th imperial acclamation in late AD 79 to signal that Roman conquests in Britain were complete. In AD 80, Agricola consolidated Roman rule south of the Fourth Clyde Line and turned west to invade the hills and headlands of Galloway. This was the territory of the Novante tribe, whose homeland faced the Ulster coast. Tacitus explains that Agricola spent the fourth summer securing what he had obtained, and, with the new border established by a line of garrisons, the entire nearer side was secured. During these operations, Agricola discovered a shorter crossing to Ireland as Galloway was only 19 nautical miles from the Antrim coast. This North Channel passage could be crossed in three hours and would provide a shorter invasion route than the military crossing from Deva Vitrix to the Leinster coast. The Roman military build-up on the Firth of Clyde is confirmed by archaeology. In the 1980s, the remains of two legionary encampments were discovered at Girvan Mains, on the coast facing the thousand-foot-high offshore volcanic outcrop known as the Elsa Craig. Each fort would have accommodated a legion of 5,000 troops plus several thousand auxiliaries. Fortified marching camps have also been found at Gatehouse of Fleet, Newton Stewart and Glenluce, along a Roman road leading to the shores of Loch Ryan. This natural harbour is sheltered by the Stranra Hills, and lies only twenty miles from Antrim. Here the Roman fleet would have been assembled within sight of Ireland. It is likely that Agricola prepared the Ninth and the Twentieth Legions to take Roman conquests into the neighbouring Irish territory. As part of these plans, he accepted support from an exiled Irish chief who promised him assistance. Tacitus reports, Agricola received a ruler of these people who had been expelled by an internal dispute. He was retained under what seemed to be an alliance for the occasion when he could be used. Agricola could have planned to install this man at Navan, the nearest regia, royal site, marked on Roman maps. The campaign began when Agricola sent out naval reconnaissance parties to investigate the islands surrounding the Firth of Clyde. These were probably swift warships, known as Liburnians, that could either be sailed or rowed by a team of sixty oarsmen. One of the agents aboard these vessels was a Greek named Demetrius, who left bronze tablets at the legionary fort of the Ninth Legion at Eboracum. The tablets are dedicated to the maritime gods Oceanus and Tethys, who presided over the encircling world ocean. The Greek writer Plutarch describes how his brother met a man, also called Demetrius, at the Greek shrine of Delphi. Demetrius was travelling back to Tarsus in Asia Minor, Turkey, after finishing his service in Britain. Plutarch reports, Demetrius said that there are many isolated islands lying near Britain that are remote or have few or no inhabitants. Some of these islands are named after divinities or heroes. On the emperor's order, he made a voyage of inquiry for observation to the nearest of these islands, which had only a few inhabitants, including religious men. Some of the data used by the Greek geographer Ptolemy to construct his map of Ireland in the 2nd century AD 
would have been based on similar military surveys. In the summer of AD 81, Roman forces based on the Caledonian coast launched a westward seaborne assault on a previously unknown population. The ancient Britons spoke a soft-sounding Celtic dialect known as Brythonic, but the Irish pronounced a harsh-sounding variant that survives as modern Gaelic. It was therefore possible for the Romans to distinguish between British and Irish populations. According to Ptolemy, the Western Isles of Scotland were Irish territory, including Arran, Islay, Jura and Mull. This ancient association appears in early Irish traditions, including the Ulster Cycle, where warrior youths from Connacht and Ulster attend training camps in the Western Isles. According to Ptolemy, the Celtic population in Antrim and the Mull of Kintyre both had tribal names connected with horsemanship, which suggests a common association. These close cultural connections continued in late antiquity with the formation of a sea-linked Scots-Irish kingdom called Alriada. It is possible that Agricola's campaign encompassed the sparsely inhabited Western Isles, but the mention of well-populated territories suggests otherwise. Tacitus reports, Agricola crossed over in the first ship to peoples who were up to that time unknown to us, and, with a series of successful battles, subdued them. This text appears in a passage about Ireland, and the reference to unknown peoples who were overcome in a series of battles would indicate prolonged operations, maybe to reduce an Irish presence around the North Channel and the sea lanes leading to the new Clyde Forth frontier. One possibility is that the Roman fleet transported troops from Girvan to the island of Arran, or the Mull of Kintyre. The Mull Peninsula projects westward towards Ireland, at a point where the North Channel narrows to 12 miles at its headland. This would have permitted Roman forces to observe the Antrim coast and control entry into the Irish Sea. With the conquest of Ireland, the Roman frontier would have been reduced to a 12-mile sea lane and a 40-mile land border between the Clyde and Forth estuaries. The Irish Sea would have become a secure Roman protectorate, encircled by subject territories. The offshore action could explain a comment by a contemporary Roman satirist named Juvenal, who writes, We have now promoted our arms beyond the shoreline of Ireland. The phrase, ultra litora, suggests an aggressively contested inland campaign. The next phase might have been the conquest of Ireland, with Agricola launching an assault down the east coast supported by the accompanying fleet. But the Emperor Titus died suddenly from illness in September AD 81. Tacitus concludes his description of events with the comment, Agricola posted troops on that part of Britain which looks towards Ireland, in hope of conquest rather than fear of attack. According to Tacitus, if the valour of the army and the glory of the Roman name had permitted it, a frontier, terminus, had been found within Britain. However, the Caledonians had not been subdued, and in AD 82 news reached Agricola that the newly created frontier along the Fourth Clyde Line was about to be attacked. He responded with a preemptive strike that, enveloped the territories beyond the Bototria, Firth of Forth, because there were fears that all the furthest people might rise and the land routes would be threatened by an enemy army. By this stage, the Roman fleet was positioned at the nearest side, in Girvan, for the conquest of Ireland. To counter the Caledonian threat, Agricola launched his invasion force north to flank the highlands. This region was a mountainous area with ocean inlets, headlands and offshore islands. Tacitus explains that nowhere is the sea more dominant and the tides do not merely rise up the shoreline and recede again, 
They flow far inland, among and through the hills and mountains. He states that, Firstly, Agricola explored the harbours with a fleet, which became an integral part of his force, then accompanied him to advance the war simultaneously by land and sea. The Roman infantry, cavalry and marines shared the same encampments, and Tacitus reports that they bragged of their previous achievements, comparing forest ravines and mountains with the dangers of waves and storms, victories on land with victory over the ocean. The Caledonians were said to be dumbfounded at the sight of the fleet, as their secret places of their own sea had been opened up, and the last refuge for the defeated was closed. The enemy were soon confined by waves and rocks, and more terrible, the Romans. Unfortunately, due to the effects of storm tides and coastal erosion, archaeologists cannot locate the sites of these temporary encampments. However, the west coast location of these operations is confirmed by events that summer. A cohort of newly conscripted Usapai auxiliaries seized three galleys and sailed around the entire north coast of Britain in a failed attempt to reach their German homelands. The remains of marching camps along the lowland east coast of Scotland confirm that Agricola launched a two-pronged assault on the Caledonians. His objective was to secure the Fourth Clyde frontier by blocking access to the lowlands on the east coast and eliminating the western highland population by locating and destroying their inland settlements. Tacitus describes this tactic as to desolate and call it peace, with Roman forces operating like the huntsman who penetrates the forest and the thicket in order to drive out his prey. During these operations, Agricola took command of a mobile force that entered hostile inland territories. There, he continually showed himself in the ranks and would himself choose the position of the camp when exploring the estuaries and forests. But when the Caledonians realised that the Romans had split into three separate divisions, they seized the opportunity to attack the weaker of the two land armies. They planned a surprise night assault on the turf and timber fortified camp of the Ninth Legion. Stealthily approaching the Roman camp in the darkness, the Caledonians caught most of the sentries asleep and killed them. Before the troops had time to react, the first Caledonians had broken into the compound and were causing panic. Legionaries asleep in their tents were roused from slumber by the cries of battle, and rushing to gather their weapons, they tried desperately to organise an effective defence. But Agricola had his exploratores, scouts, tracking the movement of the Caledonians. They reported back that the enemy had gathered in a single army and were heading for the camp of the Ninth Legion. Agricola ordered an immediate pursuit, closely following the enemy tracks. During the night, he sent a combined force of his most active cavalry and fastest auxiliary troops to reach the battle site with orders to assault the rear section of the Caledonian horde. A short time later, Agricola had the rest of the army raise a loud clamorous shout, a battle cry intended to alarm the Caledonians and signal to the Ninth Legion that help was coming. At dawn, the Roman standards of the main force glinted in the light of the rising sun, and the Caledonians, seeing that their position lay between two armies, were terrified by the double danger in which they found themselves. Within the camp, the Ninth revived their courage and, feeling sure of their own safety, fought for glory. They rushed forward to retake the gates and drive the enemy from their camp. Tacitus describes how this created a furious conflict within the narrow gate passages. The ferocity of this close-quarter combat was intensified by the main army fighting for the honour of having rescued their comrades and by the Ninth wanting to demonstrate that they had not needed saving. Finally, the enemy were routed, and had the Caledonians not fled into the surrounding moorlands and forests, Tacitus believes that this conflict would have ended the war. In contrast to the Irish system, 
the Highlanders had no kings that could be brought to terms. Antacidus describes their spokesman, Calgacus, the swordsman, as only one amongst many leaders, outstanding in valour and lineage. The following year, the Caledonians made up their losses by arming their youths and enlisting older men, until they had a force of over 30,000 fighters, including charioteers. Agricola managed to successfully attack their gathering site at a place called Mons Graupius, but the terrain did not suit legionary tactics, and after the conflict, almost 20,000 Caledonians escaped back into the surrounding woods and mountains. Caledonia was far from Roman sea lanes, and Tacitus describes a land lacking fertile plains, mines or harbours. Agricola's recall from Britain came in early AD 84, when he had been governor for almost double the usual term. The Emperor Domitian looked to Britain to provide reinforcements with recent experience of warfare in mountainous terrain. The 20th Legion was withdrawn from Caledonia, and Legio II Odrix was transferred from Diva to Moesia. As Tacitus comments, Britain was subjugated, then immediately released. Roman withdrawal meant that Agricola left no lasting legacy in Britain. Moreover, when the despised Domitian was assassinated in AD 96, the Senate pronounced him damnatio memore. They had his public archives destroyed, his statues defaced, and his victory monuments torn down. Any official record of Agricola's incursions into Irish territory would therefore not have survived. As for Julius Agricola, Tacitus claims that Domitian was jealous of his military achievements, and the general was retired into obscurity. But even in his old age, Agricola never forgot his attempt to bring Ireland into the empire. His son-in-law, Tacitus, were called. I have often heard him say that Hibernia could be conquered and occupied by a single legion and a few auxiliaries. This missed opportunity was to change the destiny of each nation and give Britain and Ireland a very different history. For further information, subscribe to my channel and follow the links to my books, The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean and The Roman Empire and the Silk Routes. Thank you.